Welcome to ELSO's special session webinar on COVID-19. My name is Elizabeth Moore and I'm joining you from the University of Iowa in Iowa City, Iowa. One of our basic desires as humans is a desire to feel as though we are part of something greater than ourselves. A desire to feel as though we are connected, that we have given back, and that we have made a difference in the world. At a time when social distancing is a necessity, our need to connect as a healthcare community has never been so vitally important to keeping our patients and our colleagues safe. This session will focus on the power of maintaining and growing our professional connections and the innovations to keep us connected that have emerged during this global pandemic. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's webinar is being broadcasted live on our YouTube channel. For those individuals who are not able to log onto the Zoom link, they can view now on our YouTube channel. At the end of today's webinar, the recording of this broadcast will also be available to view on demand uh, on that YouTube channel. And also keep in mind that at the bottom of your screen, you have a Q&A tab. Uh, we'll be opening up for live questions and answers at the end. So feel free to submit at any point and we'll be ready to take your uh, questions as they come in. So let me start off today's session by introducing you to an amazing group of women. First off, we have Tammy Frederick. Tammy works at Mayo Clinic in Rochester in the CVICU as a bedside RN. She has been an ECMO specialist for the past 17 years at Mayo, and she's currently involved in the ELSO Education Committee as well as the simulation team. Holly Williams is an advanced ECMO specialist and preceptor as well as a director of clinical marketing for innovative ECMO concepts. Her current endeavor is to expand education knowledge through social media and outreach to other experts. And lastly, Dr. Amy Hackman. She is Associate Professor of Cardiothoracic Surgery at UT Southwestern. She is the Chief of ECMO, as well a heart, lung, transplant, and LVAD surgeon. Dr. Hackman has a passion for ECMO education and simulation. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you ladies. Thank you very much. Um, now, first, we have our disclosures. Um, I do some speaking for both Abbott and Medtronic. Um, but really, we wanted to talk to you today about um, how this uh, WhatsApp chat that maybe many of you are a part of um, had its start. So there was a tweet from the ECMO princess that was a poll asking how many centers in the US have a patient on ECMO for COVID-19. And the answer was 15, which surprised many of us because none of us knew anyone personally uh, that had a patient on ECMO with COVID. So we said, let's start a WhatsApp group uh, that has the ECMO directors on that WhatsApp group and see if we can share our experiences in a real time fashion. So what has happened is we have 256, which is the maximum you can have on a WhatsApp group. ECMO directors, coordinators, surgeons, intensivists, nurses, RTs, perfusionists are all together in this WhatsApp group. Uh, six continents are represented and even Dr. Bartlett participates. And what happens is there's a near immediate spread of information around the globe. And it, it's a real time peer review as you say, hey, what if we try IL-6 inhibitors? And you'll hear an answer from around the globe of what would happen with that therapy. So some of the things that have been discussed on that global group chat have been the clinical presentation and the course of illness, because we see that it's a little different in different parts of the world. Um, we've talked a lot about selection criteria for intubation and for ECMO in these patients. We've talked about treatment options, like what medications might be given the patient. We've talked a lot about how to prepare your ICU to receive these patients and how to prepare your hospital for when the surge happens. Talked a lot about how to protect yourself from uh, not being infected from COVID as well. And then cheering the successes of our partners around the world if someone has a successful ECMO decannulation. So when we talk about treatment, a lot of the treatment focuses on hydroxychloroquine um, and azithromycin, which has been the most common treatment used in the US right now. A lot of discussion has happened around the role of corticosteroids, which most of the time are, are not the answer for treatment, but occasionally there are times when steroids have helped. Uh, the use of antivirals, both um, currently available antivirals as well as research antivirals, the use of convalescent serum, and IL-6 inhibitors. And if you look on um, the clinicaltrials.gov, the U.S. government site for clinical trials, there are 282 trials listed right now. Most are not enrolling patients, but there are clinical trials for treatments, and that's part of that is this global collaboration that's happening. Um, ELSO is sponsoring the ECMO card, which is a registry of COVID patients. Uh, so please participate in that if you are not. 
Uh, there's some trials of antivirals. There's uh, trials related to the IL-6 inhibitors, which some of your centers may be a part of those trials. Um, some of the drugs that we've talked about in different combinations are in trial. Again, the immune serum, uh, mesenchymal stem cells, um, some talk about chemo prophylaxis for exposed healthcare providers, so trying to protect the providers. And then some other a uh, little more uh, unique treatments like hyperbaric oxygen, vitamin C, and sildenafil for these patients. But again, 282 trials uh, that are potentially underway for these patients. Some of the ICU therapies that have been discussed in the group chat have been the management of sedation on patients. So if you have a patient on very high vent settings, potentially prone on ECMO, uh, it can be hard to keep that patient sedated. And unfortunately, many centers are seeing drug shortages. So creative ways to keep your patient sedated and comfortable while, while undergoing an uncomfortable treatment uh, have been discussed in detail. Uh, we've talked a lot about the choice of anticoagulation and Tammy's gonna talk about that a little bit more. Uh, we've talked about airway management prior to intubation. So high flow oxygen, BiPAP, and again, how to protect the providers and the patient from spreading more uh, virus if you're requiring non-invasive ventilation. Talked a lot about proning because it's not something that many centers do often anymore with the usual easy availability of ECMO. And should we stop an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, which in most cases the answer is no. Another therapy that has been mentioned is the Cytosorb, which is not available unfortunately in the, in the United States, uh, but essentially a membrane that adsorbs a lot of the cytokines and inflammatory mediators in a patient that's undergoing the cytokine storm that we see sometimes uh, as they become quite ill. Uh, and it seems to have a good benefit in many patients. Uh, in the US, some centers are trying plasmapheresis or plasma exchange uh, to remove these cytokines and have seen some uh, early good results with this therapy. One of the challenges is if you use 100% or 120% of the blood volume plasma exchange, that can be 20 or 25 units of plasma, which we may not have available that much blood supply. Um, other discussions have focused on procedures on COVID-19 patients. So what is the risk to OR personnel? Uh, specifically, does electrocautery aerosolize virus? So are you exposing a large number of people if you operate on someone with the virus? Um, and then the discussion too, especially in cardiac surgery, will it change their survival if they need an emergency cardiac operation and they have a, a bad ARDS from the virus? And the most uh, common procedure discussed is tracheostomy. Um, should we do a tracheostomy on a patient that has a very high viral load? Um, is an early trach beneficial, which we would normally say yes in ARDS, or is the risk too high to the providers? Um, one thought is that by early trach, we may be able to decrease ventilator and ICU time, which we know uh, those therapies are at a premium right now. Okay, there we go. I'm Holly Williams. I'm going to be talking to you about some of the information collected on the WhatsApp group. Um, the first thing that we are going to talk about is a question that was posed a lot, which is who and when should we be cannulating? So I would say the general consensus of the group is that for the time being, a facility's normal cannulation criteria will remain in place until an actual recognized shortage of ECMO equipment is viewed. Uh, for the most part, I would say that the group saw that 65 or less was a great cannulation age strategy. There was talk that if there was recognized shortages, the facilities may tighten that up to even be 40 or less. Making sure that we have the evaluation of how many organs are actually in play at the time of cannulation. Uh, checking the patient's ejection fraction and right heart function to make sure that we're selecting the appropriate therapy, VA versus VV. We are recognizing that a lot of these patients have acute kidney injuries, so early initiation of CRRT. Uh, lots of facilities are working to make sure that they are proning, paralyzing, and using inhaled prostaglandins, such as ibuprofenol in these patients. Definitely completely ruling out DNR and DNI patients from cannulation criteria. Recognizing that size constraints may be something to look at. Uh, utilizing a BMI of 40 to 45 was certainly a discussion. One thing that I found really interesting within the group is the discussion of ruling COVID positive patients out for eCPR. Uh, the reason being that in a herd situation, staff members may inappropriately don their PPE 
putting themselves at greater risk. So some facilities felt that was the right option for them. Other places are going to continue their eCPR programs. Uh, in addition to that, we're gonna talk about ICU room setup. So making sure that we are keeping staff members as safe as possible during this time is certainly paramount. Uh, positioning all equipment to where the provider is able to see the screens from outside of the room if that is a possibility. There's also been tons of innovation with how we're gonna set equipment up in the room. Lots of facilities are adding additional IV extension tubing to their patients to be able to place the IV machines outside of the room. This allows staff to be able to change out the bags, add additional volume without having to don PPE each time. There are also some vent manufacturers that you are able to remove the screen from the ventilator module and place that outside the room as well further reducing the risk of PPE usage as well as inappropriate donning. And then making sure that we teach our staff members to cluster their care, uh, to make sure that you're prepared to go into the room, to make sure that we are eliminating as many times that we are donning and doffing PPE as possible. Uh, in addition to that, we're gonna talk about transport both in and outside of hospitals. So for our outside of hospital transport, considerations need to be made for distance and comfort of the crew. Uh, keeping in mind that you're not gonna be able to remove your mask to eat or drink during this transport. And then what type of PPE are we gonna use? It appeared that most facilities that were transporting out of hospital COVID positive patients, ECMO or not, were essentially donning head to toe PPE. This included completely covering hair, face, eye shields, uh, their complete suits were used in a lot of facilities. Also being mindful, how are we keeping our non-medical support staff safe? Are we providing education to pilots on how to appropriately wear an N95 mask? Have these people had testing to make sure that they have an appropriate fit for safety? The decision of cannulating in outside facilities or transfer, transferring these people without ECMO to cannulate in the receiving facility? And are they gonna be stable enough to transport? So a lot of these patients are prone before they are sent to an ECMO referral facility, making sure that we're testing their ability to be supine and that that is gonna be a safe patient for transport. Uh, with regards to inside of hospital transports, Tammy, you wanna put up my next slide? Uh, making sure that we are providing the appropriate PPE for both the sending and receiving areas of the hospital. Uh, bearing in mind that our CAT scan group or our interventional radiology group may not be accustomed to donning and doffing appropriate PPE, making sure that they have this in their areas of care. And then we need to make sure that we ensure the safety of other patients. It's very likely these patients are going to have to be moved down hallways. We all know from transporting our vented patients through hallways that we are at a very high risk of ventilation circuit disruption. Uh, when we disrupt the circuit, we are then aerosolizing viral load into the air. Do we need to keep these patients completely covered during these transports, perhaps a sheet? Uh, it was even posed the question of using plastic to be able to cover the patients to safely move them down the hall. And those are my pieces. I am gonna turn this over to Tammy Frederick. Thanks. Thanks. All right, so I'm going to kind of round up the group here and we'll talk about some staffing uh, conversations that happened. I thought people being very creative. So uh, people suggested that staffing these rooms with four hour shifts, six hour shifts, just giving those nurses and or ECMO specialists if they need to be in the room, chances to get out of the room and not only for donning on your PPE, but for also just getting out of those rooms to have some mental break. So I thought those were very creative. Um, ECMO specialists were sharing with us that sometimes they're asked to staff four pumps, staff two pumps, or maybe something out of their normal. So it was just, we were really having some good conversations as far as how do we safely protect those ECMO specialists and make sure that they remain safe in those staffing situations. What about the ECLS interventions and alarms? So if you're fortunate enough to have a cardio help, you know you can run all the bells and whistles on those, but are they really necessary? Those machines need to stay at the bedside with the patient, 
So do we want those ECMO specialists to be in the room all the time, or is it okay for them to be outside the room, but not having to dawn on to answer every alarm? So there's centers there are, that um, we're sharing with us that simply just use tubing, a pump, and an oxygenator, no pressure monitoring whatsoever on some of these adult patients. Really good conversations back and forth about that as well. We had a couple days where we um, were discussing patient rounding. What does that look like for you and what hospitals are doing some creative things? Some hospitals went to purely all virtual rounding. Um, a lot of hospitals or a lot of centers were just decreasing the number of people that were actually rounding, limiting the number of services that are coming and going from these patient rooms. So just maybe just only the, the ECMO service in general is the one that comes in and out of the room and then everybody else just stays outside and they can have those face-to-face -face conversations. I thought this one was very creative. Someone posted that they do all their virtual discussion of the patient in their offices or at home, and then they come to the door and display that plan for the bedside nurse and the specialists that are preparing themselves for that. So Amy um, talked about I'd handle an anticoagulation. And so we know that these COVID patients tend to be hypercoagulable, but our two options when we put them on ECMO are gonna be heparin or a DTI. And I think the one, um, one WhatsApp uh, text that really hit home for me was this, this gentleman who said that he changed out his oxygenator multiple times, one after another after another, and everybody just kind of kept dinging back going, hey, use Bivel, hey, use some Argatraban, use a DTI. He responded later that evening by saying that that wasn't an option for him in his country. And that really hit home to me because like, you know, those things are accessible for us, but they're not accessible across the country. So then it just became this plethora of sharing DTI guidelines. You know, what is your bivalve guideline and what is your agatroban? So not only just sharing things that we do day to day, but really sharing some guidelines and protocols have been very important for a lot of these hospitals. It's on the WhatsApp. Lastly, I'm gonna talk about PPE. And we know this is the hottest topic out there. We see it in the media, we see it everywhere. The newspaper, you can't open up Twitter without getting hit with all the PPEs and this was probably the number one thing we discussed on WhatsApp. Don't you agree, ladies? Yeah, uh, right from day number one, when we started this, like on March 17th to even this morning, things are still popping up about PPEs. And it's been very fluid, just like it has been in everybody's hospital. But you can see it's everything and anything people are preparing themselves. But what I found was creative was ways that people were looking at how can we make this efficient and cost-effective for our, our um, providers. So this was an example of someone that actually bundles everything together. The bunny suit, the um, N95, your goggles, your hair, your booty um, covers. So it's just all compact. The provider can grab it down themselves and then go into the room. And then this was a gentleman, he was very proud. He was gonna go in and cannulate their first ECMO COVID patient, but he is properly downed head to toe <laughs> with everything on there. So like I said, the, this was just such a very fun group of people that were sharing lots of neat things. And I think I speak for all three of us that what started as an idea to better understand many, how many ECMO COVID patients there were turned into a tremendous repository of information policy sharing, networking, group cheering successes, and support. Thank you, Liz, for having us a part of this webinar. You got it. Thank you, ladies, so much for sharing. I know that that's been a wonderful source of information sharing, and I can't thank you guys enough for bringing that about to the ECMO community and just the healthcare group and all, you know, just even some of the positive sharing. And congratulations as people have been getting their ECMO patients off has just been fun to give everyone kudos. So great work. Thank you. All right, so we are going to transition over and I'll let uh, Dr. Badalak start sharing her screen now. I think we still have her available. Um, so she is an emergency physician and intensivist caring for patients in the cardiothoracic and medical ICU at the University of Washington Medical Center, as well as in the trauma surgical ICU emergency department of Harborview. She serves as the director of ECMO education for the University of Washington and Harvey. Harbor View Medical Centers in Seattle. So we are excited to have her kind of share as uh, most of us know for the US in particular, um, Seattle was kind of the first hot spot. So we're excited to let her share her experiences on how they uh, prepared for uh, COVID-19 and as well as some novel ways that even the Pacific Northwest coordinated their efforts. So take it away, Janelle. Here we go, am I unmuted now? 
Um, so just to, uh, like Elizabeth said, talk a bit about our experience in Seattle and some of the uh, preparatory steps we've taken that can hopefully help some of the other centers. Um, so um, uh, the overview in the past, our first patient was diagnosed in the United States was in Washington in January 21st. Um, then we had an outbreak um, at a communal living area with our first death at Harborview Medical Center on February 29th. Um, initially attempting to isolate spread of the virus, but we um, were unsuccessful and they kind of rapidly moved into uh, sustained community spread. So while we were anticipating um, or seeing this happen and overwhelming some local hospitals near outbreaks, um, we moved into rapid development of hospital protocols and the University of Washington Virology Lab really um, um, did amazing things to create testing that was available with turnover times that were initially about 24 hours and quickly whittled down to just a couple of hours. Um, presently, where we are now is sustained community spread. We have um, in the state of Washington 4,800 cases and uh, about 200 deaths. Um, we've been aggressive with rapid testing. Um, our positivity rates about 4.4% of symptomatic healthcare staff. Um, and about 10% of our admitted or high risk um, discharged patients. Um, and then we've been working on offloading hospitals that are at capacity um, and then also reconfiguring the way that we zone uh, patient care. So hot zoning with tents in front of emergency departments and cohorting admitted COVID patients within the hospital. Future things, uh, we're, right now we've been very lucky um, due to aggressive physical distancing measures to flatten the curve, to be able to keep up with the demand on critical care um, and acute care and emergency care. So our goal is to remain at contingency care. We're planning for an anticipated surge, which continues to change based on how effective the community is at decreasing transmission, which we anticipate to happen in eight days and then redeploying um, emergency um, and critical care staff to various uh, um, areas with higher volume. And then there's also been a lot of work for a regional coordinating center using the Microsoft platform that was developed for inter-hospital patient movement, which is really important that we don't want any hospital in the region to reach crisis standards while other hospitals still have uh, capacity. So we're also building, in case we need to use it, protocols for crisis capacity, so crisis standards of care of um, allocation of scarce resources. So ideally, hopefully, we can, we're can. we trying to remain at conventional or contingency capacity where we have some disruption in ordinary use of resources and practices, but we're able to maintain and defend the standard of care. Um, and then, so I'll talk a little bit about how we're functioning in that, um, in that arena, whereas some other cities, unfortunately, are moving more quickly into crisis capacity. And then just to kind of diagram out uh, this kind of concept um, that uh, many are becoming familiar with that if you're able to stay within conventional or contingency um, uh, standards, then you're, um, you don't have to move towards um, uh, pre, uh, uh, allocating scarce resources. And it's a matter of trying to uh, maximally utilize the resources that you have and how that comes up with ECMO is this balance between prematurely rationing with an idea of you're going to be very busy in the future versus um, uh, uh, you know, you, trying to help as many people as you can with this really limited resource. So the Institutes for Health Metrics and Evaluation, the IHME, which is based at the University of Washington, has created a really um, pretty uh, successful modeling um, system for uh, predicting surge in capacity for various areas. So this is for um, the state of Washington looking at our um, all the beds that we may need and our ICU beds in particular. And, and so far we're in a uh, place where we will just reach the maximum capacity for critical care in our state. Um, different states are looking at exceeding this, in particular New York um, is, is, is uh, a state that's, um, that we're worried about. Um, so when we talk about this idea of avoiding crisis standards of care, it's important to reshift the load of your, um, your to, alloc to be able to move patients around and, and utilize and pool your resources. And so an effort led from um, OHSU in Portland, um, and David Zonis and Beshoy Zachary is there, um, created this um, I, uh, initiative to unite our ECMO centers in the Pacific Northwest so that we can learn from each other and our shared experience in managing patients, but then also to um, share air our capacity to get an idea of where are all the beds and where can we move patients when they are um, good ECMO cap, uh, centers. 
So, um, and it also helps, it's important to kind of unif uh, unify your ECMO patient selection criteria because then you don't have different centers calling around trying to find an ECMO center to accept a patient. If we can all work together to agree on what are the sort of pandemic, pandemic addendum to usual patient selection criteria for ECMO, just to try to find the patients that we think will be able to salvage. So um, this is the Pacific Northwest ECMO Collaborative is what has been developed and is kind of one of the silver linings to this pandemic is that we are all kind of um, communicating with each other, learning from each other um, and have an idea of what our capacity is for the, for the area for routine capacity and maximum capacity. And this is a collaborative of uh, adult and pediatric centers. And so the, again, led out of OHSU, Oregon Health and Science University, and Legacy Emanuel in Portland, Providence St. Vincent in Portland, and then in Washington and Seattle, um, we have the University of Washington Montlake and Harborview and a Swedish Medical Center. And then we have our children's hospitals, Dornbecker and Randall in, P in uh, Portland and Seattle Children's here in Seattle. So the things that we've done for preparation um, as our uh, case volume has gone up and how do we um, address, how do we utilize ECMO has been the three buckets of space, staff, and stuff whenever you're thinking of disaster planning. And so we have been cohorting uh, COVID patients, reducing nosocomial spread, um, moving from individualized negative airflow rooms into potentially a negative airflow unit, because, but it can be hard to keep someone in PPE for a really long period of time. So we've elected to uh, transform rooms into negative airflow rooms with antechambers. And like um, uh, the uh, earlier presentation was mentioning, all of our ventilator screens and medication pumps all, are all in the ante, ante room so that we don't have to go into the room very often. Um, we created uh, a COVID ICU team that takes care of everyone with COVID. And then we built a new ECMO consult team. So we're doing ECMO in a part of the hospital we've never done ECMO with and floating our ECMO specialist nurse and RTs to this area. Um, and then we're using, utilizing the McKay Cardio Help because it has self-resolving alarms. Um, and then we are not using bubble detectors or anything that would shut off the pump because it's too hard to quickly get into the room. We're using video conferencing to be able to keep an eye on the pump screen and hear alarms. Um, and it also helps because then the family can zoom in to see their loved one because we have um, no uh, visitors. Um, for regional COVID ECMO transfers, there's a couple of different considerations. Initially, we weren't encouraging transfers because we were trying to um, limit disease spread with, in, with the uh, uh, initial case showing up in Washington and hopeful that we could contain it. Um, but now we're recognizing that that's not possible, of course, with sustained spread and just trying to maximize the benefit to an individual patient if we can in our center. Um, and uh, there is a potential risk of overwhelming tertiary centers with ECMO referrals, um, and that could potentially be mitigated by utilizing mobile ECMO, where you're maximizing the ability of your, um, the spokes in um, the hub and spoke model to deliver excellent ARDS care. And then when they, if the patient fails, then potentially utilize a mobile ECMO team. And there are two uh, teams um, in Portland that are able to do primary ECMO transport that we could potentially use that. Otherwise shooting for that, um, that window of time where the patient is clearly fa failing conventional therapies, but is still uh, stable enough to transport, which we've been able to su successfully do for patients that we're transporting to the University of Washington. The process for us that we've developed is to screen um, for if ECMO candidacy when a call comes in on a case-by-case -case basis, but using somewhat narrow or selection criteria, and then doing an assessment of whether or not this, the sending hospital needs capacity relief because they're overwhelmed, and then having a conference call within our hospital to determine whether or not we're actually able to handle another ECMO patient, or if we're moving to the point of too, too much volume with critical care that maybe we shouldn't be, we aren't able to put on a little bit, a more resource intensive patient like an ECMO patient. And then if we're not able to, then we were able to, to tap into the um, ECMO network in the Pacific Northwest to find out who else has capacity and availability to take care of a new ECMO patient. So patient selection, we've narrowed. These are the criteria that we're using. Similar criteria, basically the same criteria for when we would put a patient on ECMO and asking for phone calls for patients with PDF less than 100. Um, and then we're generally cannulating with them if they're uh, less than 80, despite maximal conventional therapies. Um, contraindications, these are, um, we've been talking about this an awful lot and um, uh, working to 
uh, sort out who really being very thoughtful of who are the patients that we really think that are salvageable and we can give them the best shot. So targeting otherwise young, otherwise healthy patients who've not been on the ventilator for very long um, without chronic comorbidities that would um, that we know are um, associated with increased mortality with COVID um, and don't have significant end organ dysfunction with exception of AKI. Um, and um, we are not planning to offer at our institution VA ECMO or eCPR. Um, and then if we, um, once our capacity um, is more stretched, um, our relative contraindications would then become absolute contraindications. Always keeping an eye to where will we be in a couple of weeks because these ECMO runs are quite, can be long. The ventilator, time on the ventilator is long. COVID just takes a really long time. Um, cannulation, we're doing all of the bedside in the ICU and we're, um, it seems to be working just fine using a simple ultrasound um, uh, for either IJ and groin or bifemoral cannulation and um, prepping in the epigastrum to cite the wire placement and uh, the femoral cannulae uh, placement. Um, and we're doing with two cannulas, one take cannulators, one nurse and one ECMO specialist. So we haven't needed more than four people in the room to do this. Um, and then for our a brief, uh, our, our experience, we haven't had that much ECMO volume. There's been five patients in between Seattle and Portland. Um, one successfully decannulated after a seven day run at Swedish in Seattle. And the two that we've had in the University of Washington here um, are a 41 year old and a 47 year old. They were both transferred um, with refractory hypoxemia and maximal therapies here with a PEEP of 16. This 47 year old also had a traumatic intubation with a pneumothorax and a pretty big air leak. Um, IJ FEM, by FEM, um, ventilator settings. Um, we um, initially were maybe utilizing higher PEEP um, for to maintain recruitability and maybe to shorten the ECMO run, but decided to just stick with ultra low protective settings of uh, pressure control 10 with PEEP of 10. Um, and they both have associated VAP. They're both enrolled in trials for antivirals and this one got tocilizumab. We've been shooting for a higher anticoagulation goal just given the clotting that we've been hearing from our friends and actually this patient, um, we um, transitioned to comfort care after um, the oxygenator was failing and the patient was getting progressively worsening shock. This patient's actually doing quite well and, and we're hopeful for, um, uh, it, we're seeing some um, stability and in some improvement. Um, so our uh, protocols that we've written for uh, everything related to COVID at the University of Washington are available here. Uh, and then my email with any other uh, questions. And thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much, Janelle. We appreciate you sharing with us. As I know, literally as we're preparing, you were getting phone calls about consults. So I appreciate you taking the time. So up next, I have uh, Kara Agerstein. So Dr. Agerstein is a pulmonary critical care trained intensivist and associate professor of medicine at Columbia University Medical Center. New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. She's also the director of their medical ECMO program. So I will turn it over to Kara. You need to be unmuted there. Thank you, Liz, and thank you guys for having yeah. me on. So um, yeah, so uh, similar to Janelle's experience, so uh, about a few weeks later, New York City um, has you know really taken off as far as the number of COVID positive patients as well. In fact, it seems like everybody is COVID positive. It doesn't matter why um, they're here. We've actually found about 50% of uh, women presenting for normal delivery are COVID positive. So it's really just out there in the community whether or not uh, there are, uh, they, people are presenting with symptoms or not. Uh, in our ICU at, uh, at Columbia um, today, we have about 450 patients um, admitted to ICU beds. Now, we didn't have 450 ICU beds <laughs> last week, but now we have not only nearly all of our adult ICUs filled with COVID positive patients, we've expanded over to the pediatric hospital and also two separate floors of ORs, which can hold about 70 additional patients. And as of yesterday um, or so, uh, we've actually expanded onto some of the medicine floors as well, which are being converted to extra ICU space where I'm currently uh, attending. Um, so, as far as ECMO um, is concerned, we've actually placed three patients on. ECMO um, with, with COVID, uh, one was on VV and two uh, were initially on VV but quickly required conversion to VAV. And I'll sort of discuss um, their specific cases in just a moment. In general, our criteria technically are still similar to what we would uh, consider in non-COVID times. 
uh, meaning more or less consistent with the EOLIA trial. However, we are willing to consider patients typically beyond that seven day uh, intubation mark. Um, that being said, practically speaking, due to the limitation in ICU bed space and just human resources and whatnot, and anticipated um, uh, continued surge, we've been more practically limited in our ability to accept ECMO patients. In general, I'd say our criteria are very similar to Janelle's. I won't I'll repeat all of those, um, but we're certainly being uh, more judicious with whom we would consider to be appropriate um, in ECMO. Um, in the vast majority of patients, we are not offering uh, eCPR as an option either, um, with the exception, um, with very, very rare exceptions. Um, the three patients that we placed on ECMO, uh, two of them were in their 30s. They had both presented and been intubated within about 48 hours from the time we were called for VV ECMO. Um, when we were called, moderate shock, severe ARDS, PDF ratio in the 50s, despite maximal ventilator settings, um, paralysis, inhaled nitric oxide. Uh, those patients were too hemodynamically unstable to be prone. It seemed like their decompensation had been associated with a really rapid cytokine storm. Um, and they had rapidly progressive shock, renal failure, some hepatic uh, injury, no intact synthetic function. And we cannulated them both with VV ECMO. Um, however, within about 12 hours of cannulation, I think even less so, uh, we noticed that there, uh, there was a marked um, cardiac decompensation. Their pre-cannulation, at least bedside TTEs, both showed normal EF, and then several hours post-cannulation, uh, EF was under 20%. Both required initiation of arterial support. Um, you know, I think reassuringly, uh, once they were placed on arterial support, they did quite well, requiring only about two liters of arterial flow. No patient required venting or was even close to that consideration. Um, and what I think was most impressive in these two people, despite how sick they were going into it, uh, was that they really recovered to the point of decannulation uh, from the arterial limb in about one week. And one patient had his uh, venous limb removed about one week later as well. The other patient, you know, maybe about a week and a half after cannulation. We were very uh, hopeful, uh, given how sick these patients were going into ECMO, that they did not require long courses of ECMO. And I think that's something that, is unlike some of these other ARDS patients we tend to see with flu or whatnot that maybe require ECMO support for two plus weeks, you know, we were very hopeful that, uh, you know, with early action and kind of early aggressive intervention, we were able to kind of rescue these people from the brink turn them around in a reasonably quick manner, get them off ECMO to hopefully then allow us to continue doing more ECMO through this period. Um, the third patient we had was a uh, gentleman in his 50s. Uh, he required VV cannulation and was in a very profound cytokine storm at the time of cannulation on four vasopressors near max doses, uh, temperature to about 107 degrees, never had that cardiac decompensation um, and unfortunately, though he also improved from a respiratory standpoint to the point of decannulation in one week, he subsequently died of um, hemophysis on the day of decannulation. So that is our current experience. I will say, though, that even though we've just done these three patients on ECMO at this point, uh, that is in no way uh, uh, proportionate to the number of ECMO calls we have gotten. One thing we've really tried to emphasize to all of our ECMO attendings here and our teams taking these consults is to help work with referring hospitals to maximize their vent settings, use prone positioning if possible, because we have seen these patients have fantastic responses to proning, and really work with the referring hospitals to help them and help us avoid ECMO, you know, knowing that we're not able to offer it as much as we would normally be able to offer it, and we're not able to offer it as much as we certainly would like to be able to offer it. Um, so we really have I think double down on our efforts to help other places optimize traditional measures of ventilation with sub substantial success. Um, and I do think that is uh, another reassuring, uh, uh, I guess, the uh, progression um, um, of, of uh, you know, COVID in New York, at least at this time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kara, for sharing with us kind of the literal real time in the trenches discussions. I know you guys are definitely still in the thick of it. So can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing what you know now. 
um, for those of us who are on the cusp of the surge and being able to let us prepare just a little bit more of maybe thinking through scenarios that we haven't maybe thought of yet. Um, it's a really important time for the middle of the U.S. that haven't seen uh, the cases quite yet. Absolutely. And if I could emphasize one point, I really think, you know, the idea that even in these extremely sick patients who are on multiple vasopressors, all three of these patients, you know, turned around quickly once we supported them. And I, I really hope that we can use ECMO in these, you know, very sick, you know, relatively young, salital people to have good outcomes and rescue people from, um, you know, from really uh, an unfortunate uh, situation. Yeah. And I think also the piece that's been wonderful to watch um, in real time with ELSA's registry dashboard now is, is actually to see that, you know, I think for those of us who dealt with H1N1 and we remember the three and four week ECMO runs, mm -hmm. uh, I think many of us were really nervous to even think about ECMO in this scenario with a high volume of patients. But now that we're seeing, I know the Japan group shared, you know, between six and 12 days on ECMO and, and some of this early stuff that's coming out is really reassuring that there is a place for this that isn't going to overwhelm us and we may be able to help throughout the surge uh, many more patients than we initially thought. I hope so. Great. Well, thank you again. Uh, stay safe and, and I know I'll be keeping in touch with you to make sure things are progressing well there for you guys. All right. So I will um, transition over to our last uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Mathieu Schmid is an assistant professor of intensive care medicine at the University of Paris and a senior intensivist in the medical ICU in Paris. Um, I will have him switch over and share his screen. And uh, I believe you probably hold the title right now from what we can tell as having the most ECMO patients kind of uh, collectively. So I know there's a lot that are interested in hearing kind of what your experience has been so far. So thank you as well for joining us at you're, we're almost creeping on 11 o'clock at your time. So thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for your invitation. It's a pleasure to participate to that uh, uh, webinar. So I will just share my screen. Um, and uh, yeah, so I will uh, tell you a few words about the experience from, from Paris that we are uh, seeing actually. Uh, we are facing uh, two, uh, this epidemic uh, for two weeks now uh, with uh, a terrible increase of number of cases uh, per day during the last uh, week. So uh, these are my uh, disclosures, um, not specifically related to that talk. So um, when we saw that the number of uh, COVID uh, patients uh, was dramatically uh, increasing uh, day by day during the first four days, uh, we rapidly uh, thought about the logistics uh, to be efficient and to, be, uh, to have a mutualization of the resources, uh, especially because uh, at that time in France and probably in, in other parts of the world, uh, we are in context of lack of ECMO devices and limited circuits. Uh, most of the um, company are uh, shipping uh, circuits from, uh, from China and all that exportation has been stopped. Uh, also for the ECMO membrane, some of them are, are manufactured uh, in Italy for France and uh, all that exportation has been uh, stopped. So clearly uh, in France, we have, uh, especially in Paris area, we have a, a resource, uh, we, have, we have resources uh, constraints. Uh, another thing, uh, especially in Paris area, is that uh, we have only one very active mobile ECMO team, meaning that uh, there is always some, someone mob that can uh, put an ECMO uh, that can uh, go around in, in, in Paris suburb uh, with a car and put an ECMO on on a 24-hour, seven-day basis in Paris area. And uh, rapidly, uh, we saw that uh, having only one active mobile ECMO team, even if you have very, uh, a very motivated uh, uh, team, it's not enough uh, to uh, answer to all um, to all demands, ECMO demands that you, that we receive. Another thing uh, that was complicating at the beginning, and uh, we realized it uh, quickly uh, during the first days 
of that epidemic is that uh, ECMO mach machines and circuits are stored and spread in many centers. So uh, at the end, it's very difficult to have a, a real um, pictures to capture uh, where are the circuits in Paris, in which center, uh, who is able to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to share the circuits. So uh, we have uh, decided, uh, we have a rapid uh, uh, meeting uh, uh, at day two of this epidemic to uh, clearly to propose some answers. And uh, first of all, it was uh, to uh, the need to reference where are the resources in Paris area. And uh, the first thing uh, is was to, was to identify which team could candidate outside his center, even if there is not a, a properly defined uh, a mobile ECMO team, but who is going to be available to candidate outside uh, his center. So it was the first work. Uh, so we have a, a meeting with uh, ECMO ec expert in, in, uh, in Paris area to answer this first question. We have a, a we rapidly settle uh, update inventory on available ECMO machines and circuits to know where are the ECMO, where are the ECMO circuits, and where are the ECMO machines. And the last question was to uh, was to know what are the ICUs uh, able to manage ECMO patients. So it's quite easy to put an ECMO on, but then you need to have to uh, uh, retrieve uh, the ECMO. Uh, and, and to retrieve the, the patient with, with ECMO and to have an ICU team uh, who is able to manage uh, this patient with uh, training nurse, training doctors. Uh, and when you see, when you, when you have a very high uh, volume of ECMO uh, per day, it's, uh, it's quite difficult to, to have many ICUs able to manage this kind of ECMO patient. So we create uh, an expert group to propose uniform ECMO indication in that context uh, with regular uh, reassessment of that indication. I will detail it uh, just after in, in the coming slide. Uh, what we create, it was the first time that we did that. Uh, we wanted to centralize, to regulate, and to validate of uh, all ECMO indication in Paris area. So for that, we, uh, we create a unique phone numbers to be sure that ECMO resources will not be waste uh, with wrong indication, with, uh, uh, with wrong indication in, in, in small centers. And uh, by this way, it was a way for us to have a live count on available ECMO machines and circuit. So it was uh, something that was done in a few days. Uh, we had a, a couple of meetings during this intense uh, two days, but it was the, 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 basics, the basis of our, uh, ECMO management uh, in Paris area. So uh, we uh, redefine uh, the indication uh, uh, and we uh, propose uniform indication. We spread the indication that we proposed in that content uh, of uh, in that context of uh, resources uh, constraint. Uh, so uh, clearly, uh, we follow uh, the actual um, guidelines uh, that was recently uh, published, uh, but with the use of uh, all available. Uh, uh, therapies in ICU to try to avoid uh, uh, doing ECMO. And uh, what we proposed is uh, a strict application of the EOLIA criteria. So we use uh, uh, the PF ratio. The PF ratio should be below 80 for more than six hours uh, to be uh, eligible for, uh, potentially eligible for VV ECMO or to have a PF ratio below 50 for more than three hours. So these are the two criteria relative to hypoxemia. And the third one is uh, relative to uh, uh, respiratory acidosis with a pH lower than 7.25 with a PaO2 over 60 millimeter mercury. What was special uh, in that context of uh, resource um, constraints 
uh, is that we said that prone positioning is mandatory. You have to prone your patient because proning is quite developed in France. Uh, we can do it in every center. It doesn't cost anything. And, uh, uh, it, and also we, we saw many patients improving uh, with uh, proning. So we really find as well uh, the contraindication, we were much more restrictive than we are usually. Uh, we define uh, that uh, age over 65 uh, will be a formal contraindication for uh, uh, ECMO, severe comorbidities, but this is quite like usual. Uh, what was new is that uh, we restrict uh, ECMO for severe immunocompromised status patients, uh, hematological patients, advanced cancer, and even um, graft. Uh, patient with uh, transplant, uh, we uh, we say that it's uh, it's quite a formal contraindication, ex except maybe a renal transplant, which might be uh, still acceptable. Cardiac arrest, uh, except if there is witness bystander CPR, if a low flow is lower than 15 minutes, these were the uh, initial contraindications that we define uh, uh, with the increased of the number of ECMO per day, we, uh, we are much more restrictive. And actually, uh, this morning, for example, we refused uh, uh, to put an ECMO on in a cardiac arrest uh, with a, a low flow of only five minutes um, because we are lacking of uh, ECMO devices and circuits. Uh, MV duration over 10 days uh, is a still a formal contraindication. Multiple organ failure is a contraindication, except isolated um, acute kidney injury, uh, which is quite frequent uh, in, in that uh, patient and with that uh, disease. Another contraindication that we uh, had uh, recently is a BMI over 35, um, considering that this patient uh, is going to be very long ECMO run, they will, they will uh, be stuck in a bed for uh, weeks or even months uh, with uh, probably a, a lower uh, outcome. So this is a situation uh, in, in Europe actually. Uh, as you see, uh, ECMO is quite done in, in many countries uh, with uh, higher uh, ECMO numbers in Italy, but also in France. I don't have a, a real explanation. Maybe I don't know, maybe as, at least in, in, in Paris, uh, we are well organized. We have a very active mobile ECMO team. Um, so we can put 10 ECMO per day, uh, which is actually uh, our uh, daily rate. And this is uh, uh, the uh, ECMO um, implantations in Paris area. So the first patient, it was clearly the first case uh, in Paris. Uh, a not Chinese case. Uh, it was uh, a guy who was uh, 62 years old. He has a massive PE after six days on a mechanical ventilation. He did a cardiac arrest. We put a rescue VA ECMO and he passed away uh, 12 hours uh, after uh, with a multiple organ failure. At that time, we test for COVID uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2 and it was positive. It was very surprising for everyone. And you can imagine uh, the mess that uh, will happen after this uh, first case uh, in Paris. And as you see, this was the first ECMO patient. And during the uh, next two weeks, we didn't, had, uh, we didn't have uh, any uh, ECMO patient, uh, but we uh, start to have a ventilated patient. And uh, these patients were ventilated, uh, intubated, prone, and then we saw uh, an increase of the number of ECMO uh, per day with the mobile ECMO team. And you see that actually uh, the rate of uh, the number of ECMO per day is roughly uh, close to 12 uh, ECMO uh, per day uh, performed by uh, the mobile ECMO team. So uh, actually uh, we have 49 uh, ECMO cases we are running in La Pitié Sapetria Hospital. So we spread the ECMO in different uh, ICUs because we were not able to have uh, all uh, ECMO uh, patients in our ICU. We have already 25 ECMO patients out of 25 beds, uh, which is quite a, a lot already. 
and we have uh, 32 cases in other Paris uh, hospitals. So uh, just to give you a, a, a quick um, capture of uh, our ECMO patient, we have 25 ECMO patients out of 25 ICU beds. I did it uh, uh, yesterday. We have 24 uh, VV, one VAV. As you see, the age of the patient is quite young, 49 years old uh, in medium, uh, a large proportion of, of males uh, compared to females. Uh, ECMO has been uh, performed after uh, this start after four days of uh, mechanical ventilation. Uh, most of the patient has repeated uh, prone positioning before ECMO, and actually ECMO is running uh, for nine days in medium uh, at the date of yesterday. Uh, what we do, uh, we prone all ECMO patients. Uh, most of these patients are obese patients. Um, so uh, clearly uh, we have seen uh, many patients uh, improving uh, with uh, proning on ECMO. To uh, date we have five, we had five ECMO winning so far. One VA, the VA was uh, due to a, a pulmonary embolism which is quite frequent in, in that patient. We have four VV uh, wins so far but as you see, we have no extubation for now, meaning that even after removing ECMO, you have still a long way uh, to have a success. Uh, so this is just another way to express uh, ECMO in Paris area, actually 108 ECMO running. As you see, we have, uh, uh, we have 10%, uh, we have 12%, we have almost 10% people, uh, 12, 10% deaths, 10% uh, winning, but obviously uh, these uh, numbers are uh, very preliminary and it's very difficult to raise any conclusion with that. Just a few uh, specific points that we uh, have learned uh, with our experience. High risk of thrombosis in, in that patient. Uh, we diagnosed seven uh, uh, PE, uh, severe PE, huh? uh, out of 35 uh, ECMO patients that we received in the department get two membrane thrombosis. So uh, we decided to, to do full anticoagulation on ECMO for that patient, targeting APTT above, uh, target APTT uh, between 60 to 80 or anti 10 a activity between 0 0.3 to 0 0.5. Uh, this is very different of what we do usually. Usually we don't anticoagulate too much, especially VV patients. Uh, but uh, in that context, with a very high risk of thrombosis, we uh, switch to full anticoagulation uh, for uh, this patient. Uh, and also we do uh, a CT pulmonary angiography uh, as soon as uh, uh, we have a dilated RV um, right ventricle and as, as soon as we have a pulmonary acidosis uh, before uh, ECMO. Uh, another question, another point, uh, do we have soft scopes to scavenging? Uh, we did a study on 15 patients with positive plasma RNA detection and 13 patients without plasma RNA detection. And we tried to uh, investigate if we, we saw uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the gas outlet side of the oxygenator and SARS-CoV-2 was never detected uh, in the drops of uh, the gas outlet. So probably the virus is too big uh, for uh, the pore of, of the membranes. Uh, last point, probably uh, just an advice. Uh, probably we need to be patient. Uh, we have quite a high pressure uh, uh, in our in our hospital because we need bed. We need beds every day. We are looking for beds for new patients, and uh, sometimes some clinicians don't understand uh, uh, why uh, we we need to wait for this ECMO patient. We need to be very patient. Long ECMO runs are expected. Just uh, an example of a patient that we decannulate uh, this morning. So 45 years old, he, he spent 25, 21 days on ECMO. You see the chest X-ray at the time was catastrophic with the intravenous hemorrhage. Uh, but clearly, we need to be patient, and we if we have success, it's gonna be probably long ECMO run and we need to be very patient. So my conclusions, uh, most patients have stabilized uh, will on ECMO with very, very severe lung disease, frequent associated kidney injury. Uh, clearly not all patients die on ECMO. It was a controversial uh, question uh, in, in Paris in the previous days. 
Uh, some patients have been weaned after less than 10 days of support, but others may require weeks of support. So clearly it's too early to draw any conclusion. We need time to evaluate a result. Uh, but if we want to have, if you want to see success, uh, we need to be patient and, and, and not to, 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 to have a too quick uh, conclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful information shared there. And like I said, I, I knew many were having eyes on, on Paris and, and seeing those numbers that were shared. So thank you so much for taking the time to hang with us this evening and share that. Um, I do have some questions. So panelists just kind of watch who are muted. Um, I'm going to direct a few out here. And um, I know that some of the panelists have been answering in real time over the app. Um, However, let me just go ahead. And this question would be for Janelle. So Janelle, um, can you discuss your thoughts on not offering DA ECMO? Yeah, um, this was a, a question that we spent a lot of time thinking really hard about. Um, and uh, for us, it's coming down to a couple of things. Mainly, one of the big things is logistics. So in order for us to cohort all the COVID patients in an isolation pod, that means you have an ICU team taking care of a myriad of different types of patients, whether they have a transvenous pacer and are COVID positive and not sick from COVID with, or sick with COVID with ARDS or now on ECMO and they've never done ECMO before. And we you, usually the places where we do ECMO, where everyone's familiar with all, where all of the, um, the supplies um, and, it, and it's a comfortable place where we're used to doing ECMO and the primary team writing all the orders and getting all the calls does ECMO. Um, this is uh, something that we felt we wanted to be able to offer ECMO and a VV ECMO patient is very different than a VA ECMO patient. Um, and uh, recognizing that we didn't think we'd be able to push our system hard enough to do VA in addition to VV. Um, so kind of recognizing that the system's already quite stretched and the goal is to do the most good with what you have, that VV is what we can do. Um, and it is really hard um, because we have, we just had a very young patient um, was improving and then had a hemodynamic collapse that was unexpected. Um, but uh, at this point, that was the main decision maker. And then also, I mean, the PPE uses goes way up with VA. Um, either you have to find an ability for someone to sit pump for multiple hours, which is really hard and taxing on um, the bedside provider, or you're using a lot of PPE going in and out for a more unstable patient, whereas VV ECMO patients tend to be much more stable. Um, also, if we ended up needing a mechanical vent, how would we move that patient through the, through the hospital, go to the cath lab, put an impella? Are we going, is that something we're going to run into? Maybe not, but um, those are a lot of the things that kind of came up as we were trying to sort out, are we able to add in this additional level of complexity um, to a brand new system to try to be able to offer ECMO for COVID? Um, the other question that we don't know, and it's really, it was really nice to hear um, uh, Kara's experience in New York of having some success is we don't know sometimes with this catastrophic hemodynamic collapse that happens, is this truly a rescuable cardiomyopathy or myocarditis, or is it a, um, a really catastrophic cytokine release syndrome and a vasoplegia? Because it can be kind of unclear. Even when you're doing echoes, sometimes EF is actually sort of preserved, but your venous uh, saturation or your central venous saturations are going down. It can be tough to know what's actually causing the collapse and is it something rescuable with echo? Is it truly cardiogenic shock? So trying to find out which patients those are. And I think if the system's able to do it and you have a young, otherwise healthy salvageable patient. It seems like it makes sense, especially if there can be success and have meaningful outcomes is really important. So I wouldn't say that what we're doing applies to other centers, just depends on what you can do within your own capacity. Great. Thank you, Janelle. And Kara, she kind of tipped uh, to you in there. Any thoughts or considerations that you guys did? Because I know you had some conversions. I you know, agree. I think it's hard to know what the uh, cardiac decompensation or is or the shock is necessarily related to, particularly at the time of cannulation. I will say in one of the two patients who required VAV, I think we thought there was more of a myocarditis picture due to persistently elevated and moderately high troponins. Um, and in the other patient, you know, they were much lower. So it was a little bit unclear, maybe more likely from the actual cytokine storm itself. Um, but, um, you know, again, I think, you know, we tend to monitor people from outside the room. We don't have someone sitting 
you know, at the pump per se. And so while we've been very thoughtful about our uh, staff and physician and surgeon exposure, um, you know, it's been something that we think we've been able to handle in a very reasonable uh, time period or in a reasonable way, these patients. Great. And I know we have one more question for you and then I know Duty is calling for you to escape here. Um, so would you do ACMO on a patient that was not able to be proned? If not uh, able to prone, what would be acceptable reasons? So we would ask uh, certainly any center that's capable of proning, that was comfortable proning, a patient that they consider to be stable enough to do so first. Not only because we've seen a tremendous response. I mean, people who've had PDF ratio in their 50s, center said, we're willing to try proning and the next gas and going forward has been over 200. I mean, so really a fantastic response where ECMO would not have been appropriate given the evidence that we have for proning in any type of ARDS, particularly so in this you know, very resource limited um, scenario that we find ourselves. Um, I think an appropriate reason to not prone would be this sort of rapidly progressive shock, you know, extreme hemodynamic instability, which are the main reasons that we've come across. And certainly in those situations, you know, we're willing to certainly, uh, you know, overlook that it's not appropriate. Um, and we will proceed to ECMO, you know, once the center is optimized them from a medical perspective. Great. And then are you proning on ECMO was the other question. We have proned on ECMO uh, in the past due to the staff limitations and I think the PPE and the number of people that would take us to do that safely, we would not be proning COVID patients on ECMO. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question, um, it kind of targeted towards Amy and Matu, just talking about um, the anticoagulation targets. Um, and I believe that, it, just curious what in Paris first, what was the targets for ACTs and anticoagulation management and whether you're using heparin as an anticoagulant? I'm oh, sorry. We use uh, heparin as an anticoagulant. We, we don't use ACT, we use APQT or anti TNA activity. Uh, we try to have a APTT twice. Um, and so it's a PTT between 60 to 80. Um, and this is clearly uh, not usual practices uh, on VV patients. So we have increased uh, the anticoagulation due to the high rate of uh, pulmonary embolism. Most of or VA are, uh, most of the VAV are usually uh, IADS patient with VV and at day three, four, he, he, did, um, he did a massive PE, uh, which needed, uh, which require uh, a VAV. So for that reason, uh, to prevent for also a membrane uh, thrombosis in the context of uh, restriction, uh, resources uh, restriction, we use high anticoagulation. Right. And Amy, that question for you as well. So definitely would run heparin higher. Usually with VV, I try almost no heparin if I can get away with it, just sub Q for DVT prophylaxis. But clearly in these patients, something is different. So uh, more like my VA ECMO targets, at least on a VV ECMO patient. And Janelle, I know just messaged as well that she runs her PTT 60 to 80 um, or her 10 A levels 0.3 to 0.5 um, for VV ECMO patients as well, which is I think in most places very high. Right. Thank you, guys. And a uh, question for Holly around transportation. Um, and just, I think, just kind of, again, an overview of um, the products and how you're cleaning the, uh, the equipment as you come back from those transports, just maybe just kind of going over logistics of that whole transport piece that people are interested in hearing about. Sure, absolutely. So I have personally not transported one of the COVID positive patients as of yet. Um, the portion of my PowerPoint was more just a collaborative information revenue or source of what we had on WhatsApp. Uh, I think that probably the same way that we've always cleaned our equipment, I mean, using whatever is going to be institutionally specific to your facility. Great. And I, I know that this question's come a lot and I might be opening a can of worms with this one, but just curious for people uh, scavenging the gas uh, on the oxygenator. And I know Matu, you commented um, in your presentation on that. Um, and there's just a lot of people wanting to know. So I, I'm guessing from Paris, your consensus is that there's not a need to scavenge the gas. 
Um, any no, further no. comments on that? Because I will say we got about 10 questions uh, related to that topic and a lot of people wanting, I think, peace of mind about whether the virus can pass through that. No, we, we heard about this news, but it's probably a fake news. Uh, there is no no spread uh, of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, through the gas outlet. And we analyze uh, the drops, uh, even for patients who are positive in the blood, they were negative uh, in the gas outlet. Great. Anyone else in the panel that has uh, had that question and have made a definitive that they're not scavenging? Janelle? One thing that um, we've decided is all patients who are sick enough to require ICU level care should be in airborne uh, isolation. Um, so uh, it, even it's, it's it, it, the, when we think about whether or not the virus should be able to penetrate the polymethylpentine membrane, we don't think so. It's nice to hear uh, Matthew's um, uh, data gathering as well. Um, but it's also really important for us that if you have a patient who is intubated, there's a risk of circuit disruption at any point in time. And it's not just for the process of intubating or doing a bronchoscopy or suctioning. We keep all patients, all providers and airborne precautions while they're in that room. And so potentially if there was aerosolization from the exhaust, it, even though we don't think that's the case, um, our, pa our providers are in full, are in airborne PPE. We do the same. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, well, I believe we've kind of hit some of the main uh, questions here, and I'm pretty sure we could probably all sit on here throughout the night um, and continue this wonderful conversation, but I know we're a little beyond our hour, um, so I'm going to wrap up at this point. Uh, thank you again to all the speakers. I cannot say thank you enough uh, for agreeing to come and share your expertise uh, and talk with us uh, all. We've, we're about 140 strong on this Zoom meeting, and I know based on our other webinars, um, these discussions have been reaching thousands, so I, I know this is helping to get the information out there on caring for these sick patients. Uh, thank you to my behind the scenes team, Velia and Dr. Eric Edelman, who have been helping me try to field questions and make sure we're doing our best to uh, get all the information back out to all the participants today. And just a few reminders before we log off, uh, ELSO COVID-19 registry dashboard is now live. You can see some real-time data available on patients who have been placed on ECMO. Submission to the dashboard is open to ELSO members as well as non-ELSO members. Um, just log on to the website uh, and there's a very quick process to get those added. And thank you again for joining. Watch our social media web pages uh, for further information. Uh, I know that these webinars have been a huge hit and we've had a lot of people joining and sharing thoughts and experiences. So we hope to continue to do so in the coming weeks uh, to continue sharing information. I hope everyone stays healthy and stays safe in the coming weekend and the days to come. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.